Hi everyone, it's Friday the 4th of October as I'm filming this and you will be able to tell by the upload date of this video how long it took me to make. I have no idea. I want to do a reading vlog but with a theme. I thought it would be fun to pick some books that are just about to come out or have just come out that are quite hyped read them, talk to you about them as I'm reading them, are they overhyped, are they worth the hype, all of that, because some of these are on my most anticipated releases and some of them I'm just really intrigued by, so I thought we could discover them together. I have four books but possibly five on my TBR, it depends because they're all really quite big, it depends how long it's taking, if it's taking far too long maybe we'll stick to four, if not we'll do five. I'm quite chill about it. So the books on my TBR, firstly I have The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood, I have read this, so this is a reread. I read it first when I was 17, and then I reread it, I think, about 10 years ago. I need to revisit the world of Gilead, hang out with June a little bit, so that I can then read The Testaments by Margaret Atwood, which is the new release. Much hype, much excite. Um, I probably could read this without rereading The Handmaid's Tale, but I don't want to miss any nuances. I want to go in um, kind of giving this book all that I can because I'm, I'm quite nervous about it. So I am gonna reread The Handmaid's Tale in audiobook form. I found an audiobook which is partly narrated by Elizabeth Moss, I think that's her name. She's in the TV series, which I did start watching but stopped. It wasn't bad, in, in fact, if anything, it was too good, it was too intense. I, I prefer the reading experience of it to watching it. I think it works better for me in the written form. So I'm gonna listen re-listen to the novel and then move on to this one and I'll tell you my thoughts. I'll talk about it when I get to it. The next one is this which I've already started. This is The Imaginary Friend by Stephen Chbosky. Huge! 700 pages. I've read 100 pages so far. He is the author of The Perks of Being a Wallflower, which came out 20 years ago, which makes me feel old. It was a really important book to me as an early teen and I... I'm not normally into horror, which is what this is, but because I loved his first book so much, even though I'm not sure I would adore it so much if I read it for the first time now, I want to give this one a shot. As I said, I've started reading it, I'm 100 pages in. Some bits I'm finding gripping, some bits I'm finding a bit clumsy. It's falling into some predictable, tropey things that horror often does, which I'm not a fan of, but we shall see how it goes and I'll talk about it more as I'm reading it. This is about a young boy called Christopher, who disappears for six days into the woods and when he comes back he's never the same again. The next one, which is one that I'm not sure will be in this video, as I said we'll see how we get on with time wise, but if I have time I'm going to read this which is The Starless Sea by Erin Morgenstern. She is the author of The Night Circus which I actually haven't read. It's one of those books and this may sound silly but I almost feel like I've read it because everyone has talked to me about it. Um, so I want to get to this one before I feel the same about this one too. So this one is out in November, it's not out yet, it's about a subterranean library, it's about books with secrets in them, it sounds right up my street. So I will get to this one if I have time. The last one is one that I haven't got a copy of yet but I'm going to go buy it today. It is books in my bag tomorrow, it is National Bookshop Day so I have this glorious tote bag which at the moment doesn't have any books in, it has, <coughs> excuse me, it actually has some plastic in here which I am going to take into the new body shop that's opened in the centre of town. They have a, I can't remember the name of it, but they are accepting plastic containers from any cosmetics or um, body lotions etc from any company and they will recycle it. So I've got some plastic to take to them and I want to go in and check out their refillable, non-plastic, body, what's the word? Shower gel, that's it. They have a shower gel, a reusable container so you can take it in every time and refill it. So I'd like to get one of those. But I am gonna put a book in my Books in My Bag bag. After that, they very kindly also sent me a 10 pound gift voucher. So I'm gonna go into probably foils is the nearest place to where I'm going to be and I'm going to pick up a copy of The Secret Commonwealth by Philip Pullman. This is the second book in the Book of Dust trilogy. I was reflecting on my thoughts on the Book of Dust, the first one, and I'm not, I don't know, I, I wasn't in love with it. I loved visiting the world again but the pacing of it felt a little strange to me. I'm really excited to read this one because the first Book of Dust was set before the His Dark Materials trilogy, but the next two, 
a set afterwards, I think 10 years afterwards, Lyra's in her 20s, and I'm so excited to get back to Lyra. So I'm gonna go pick up that book today, and I'll start reading at some point, and I'm so excited, but also really, really nervous. You know when you really, really want to love something? If you're new, His Dark Materials, my favorite books of all time. So no pressure, Philip, no pressure at all. I'll take you into town with me, cause you know, I know you wanna see foils, and then I will share some random clips of my life as we go, and when I've got thoughts to share on the books, I'll sit down and talk to you. That sound good? I hope so, because that's what this video is. Hi, it's Saturday and we have, sorry this is probably very bouncy, we've come out on a walk. It's nice to get out of London for the weekend. So we're walking through Surrey to one of my favourite places which is called Thursley. And it's very beautiful and very autumnal. And I feel like I'm looking quite autumnal too, which I'm always aiming for. This is a church in Thursley and it's from Saxon times and it's really cute to pop in and we found these um, which are postcards of some of the kneelers that they have down here. Uh, so I thought I would pick one up to send to Tracy. Uh, her newest book was called The Single Thread and it was all about the making of kneelers. So these cost a pound and it goes in the wall safe. And Tracy, I will put these in the post. folks it is the following weekend I don't think I oh know it's focusing I just didn't have my glasses on <laughs> there we go it's the next weekend it's Sunday morning it is the is it the 12th today 13th it's the 13th today uh Mr M is still in bed but you can't see him because he's 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 over there um and oh let me click the focus so it's not jumping around so much and I haven't checked in, as you will have noticed, with my reading this week because I had to do some reading for work. So I've been reading Jeanette Winterson's Frankenstein when I have had time to read. But I have managed to pick up um, The Secret Commonwealth, that's what it's called, the second in the Book of Dust trilogy. And I've started listening to The Handmaid's Tale as well. I am 200 pages into The Secret Commonwealth and I am enjoying it. It's hurting my heart a lot. Um, this isn't a spoiler because this happens at the very beginning of the book, but Lyra and Pan aren't really, I don't know, they just don't really like each other. And it's really sad. Um, they're very much disconnected. And um, yeah, that's breaking my heart a little bit. Um, but it's nice to see characters from the first book of Dust in this book. And I feel like they're more fully realized here maybe because they're interacting with characters that I already know too so I'm enjoying reading about Lyra 
as a 20 year old, 21 year old woman um, and yeah I'm intrigued to see where it goes. I was reminded that in the first Book of Dust book they did use disfigurement as a marker for villainy and when it came back to that section it made me tense up a little bit still not okay with that um but i am enjoying the book so far i'll report back once i've read more and i am listening to the audiobook of the handmaid's tale i was really worried that i wouldn't enjoy it as much you know rereading it again it's been 10 years since i read it it's so measured it takes such skill to tell a story like this and tease it out so gently and have the courage and the conviction of the story that you're telling to be as slow as that but to still give enough detail that it's intriguing it doesn't feel as though it's you know dragging or anything like that there is a scene where Offred where June is talking about how she likes to take her time over new things because she doesn't get to experience new things very often so when she moved into the commander's house she gave herself a tiny bit of her bedroom to examine every single day so that she didn't run out of things to do and that's what this book feels like as though she's slowly focusing and talking about different areas of her life and there are lines that I remembered and I was surprised at the details that I remembered such as her keeping butter back so that she can moisturize her hands and her saying that she would stand on a corner pretending she's a tree um so yeah I'm I'm loving it I'll talk about it more once I've read more um we are going to go to Columbia Road Flower Market today and I will show you some clips from that because it's a nice place to go to update you at the weekend it's the following Sunday it's Sunday the 27th of October I'm not feeling that well I've been fighting off a cold all week and I feel like it's finally getting me um book tour for Franklin and Luna and the book of fairy tales has begun and hanging out with hundreds of children it feels like getting fresh as flu or something book tour flu except it's not flu it's a cold I hope it's just a cold um, but I am going to leave the house in a bit because I've been working all weekend and if I don't leave the house I am going to lose my mind slightly but anyway I'm here to talk to you briefly about books. I finished reading The Handmaid's Tale and I realised I said at the beginning of this video that I was listening to the audiobook which was partly narrated by Elizabeth Moss and the reason I said that is because three names were listed but actually she narrates the whole thing it's just the epilogue that's narrated by two different people. I love the book. I'm so glad that it is stood up to another reread and um yeah, there are just sentences that are, stay with me so much. Like, as I said, her standing on a, on a corner pretending she's a tree. Um, and then when she says, we are revisionists, the things we revise are ourselves. Um, it's, it's brilliant. I've started reading The, Ham the Handmaid's Tale. I've started reading The Testaments. I'm only 50 pages in, so I'll speak about that when, I, when I've read more. I was saying to Jean, I couldn't remember the epilogue of The Handmaid's Tale. And I wondered if the copy that I had when I was 17 didn't have the epilogue and maybe Margaret Atwood had added it later. But no, I'm pretty sure it probably did have the epilogue and I just thought it was an actual add-on academic bit about the text itself as opposed to part of the novel. So I guess I just never read it. Naughty me, you shouldn't do that. But anyway, I've read it now. Um, I've also finished reading The Secret Commonwealth by Philip Pullman. And I'm afraid I didn't enjoy it. And saying that makes me want to cry because I wanted to love this book so very much. Um, the first one, 
the uh, the Belle Sauvage. Um, the pacing, as I said, was kind of strange. And at the end, there were loads of magical elements that felt very <laughs> odd that they just suddenly appeared. Uh, and I'd hope that in this book, given that we're back with Lyra and Malcolm's in it too, all of the characters from the first book of Dust pretty much are, are in this book too. So Alice is there, Malcolm's parents, uh, Hannah, everybody is in this book, which is, which is lovely. And as I said, I think when I updated you the first time, it felt really great to feel very connected to those characters in a way that I didn't feel particularly in the first book of Dust book because they were interacting with Lyra and Pan. There are elements of this book where I thought, okay, we're getting back to the original books. And by that, I mean the feeling that I have when I read the original books. There were glimmers of that that came and went, but overall, I just found the book, I, I think there's no other word for it apart from clumsy. I found it really clumsy. It's a patchwork and maybe he's gonna bring it all together in the final book. It might be that he does that but it really does feel like it's setting up the final book. It also feels like it's trying to do far too many things in, and there were a lot of convenient things that happened. People met each other at a time that suited their needs um, or they encountered someone who couldn't see something that they needed them to not see. Um, quite literally in one case where um, a character encounter encounters a blind person who can't see who they're talking to and that's the only way that this character could ask someone for information i'm having to be really vague to avoid spoilers but yeah that was just very frustrating and i think that two three three really frustrating things in this book one i really don't like the way that these books deal with sexual assault i don't think that it's handled very well at all and it made me feel so uncomfortable and not in a way that obviously sexual assault is, is uncomfortable and it's horrible I just it, a lot of it felt I don't know how it felt I need to think about it some more but it just I don't think it worked very well this book also tries to comment on our modern world a lot within Lyra's world and that felt really forced I enjoy reading books that make political commentary on our world. You know how much I love Ali Smith's Quartet, for instance, but that's specifically what those books are for. Um, and whilst His Dark Materials definitely had an agenda and it was definitely commenting on um, patriarchy, it was commenting on the church, it was commenting on institutions that try and brainwash people, it's, yes. It has done that, but that always felt secondary to the other things going on in the book. And it didn't feel that way in, in, the, in this particular book, in The Secret Commonwealth. And it's making a different commentary this time. So in this book, there are people who are stealing, grabbing rose oil from the Middle East. So not oil, as in our modern world, but rose oil. And there's a refugee crisis. People are dying in boats as they try and flee. Aleppo is seen as a very unstable place. And there are terrorist attacks happening. There is a very strange scene which seems to be uh, some kind of reenactment of the Bat Clan, for instance. And all of that felt so jarring to me. Um, and what was also jarring is that it feels as though this world is different to the world that we were introduced to as Lara's world the first time around because there are so many magical elements that came in at the end of the Book of Dust. All of this folklore, um, as I said, magic, and obviously there was some magic in his dark materials, but I felt as if I understood the rules of that world. I knew what its limitations were, and I don't understand what the limitations of this world are anymore. And when you don't understand the magic systems and you don't understand the limitations of a world, the world starts to not feel real. Um, so, yeah, I... Those are my thoughts, and I can't really talk about it more without spoiling it. Um, but if you've read it, I would love to know what you thought. I did say on Instagram stories that I hadn't enjoyed it very much and I had so many messages from people saying that they were really disappointed with this book too. So I know that it's not just me. As I said, I really want to love it. I so want, and I will read the final book, I will. Um, and maybe I'll eat my hat because maybe all of the things that he's introduced in this book and all of the new characters and all of the new organizations, it's all gonna be tied together so very neatly but that's, it's not how I feel at the moment. Um, and there were lots of elements that felt similar to other 
fantasy books, which is going to happen in fantasy. Um, but there, were, there was a character who felt very much like Credence from Fantastic Beasts. Um, oh, it's my phone. I was like, what is that? <laughs> it was very, very loud. It's because it's connected to a speaker. That's why. Also, Lyra has found a new way to read the alethiometer and it's seen as a dangerous thing to be doing and she is uh, very interested in this new philosophy um, that Pan disagrees with and this is at the very, very beginning of the book and there is someone else in the book who's also using a new way to read the alethiometer and it's made very clear that he is a bad guy. So Lyra is doing the bad method to try and do something which she thinks is for the greater good and I was very much reminded of Grindelwald and Dumbledore as well. I'm not saying that Pullman has lifted those things, he doesn't need to lift things from Fantastic Beasts, but um, I I guess was drawing parallels with other books because it felt so not of this world. Um, it, so I was constantly just taken out and trying to link up things and um, threading thought patterns, I don't know. So that's how I felt. There we go. Uh, I will get back to you when I have read more of the Testaments. I'm going to go into town and go to get some lunch and get some juice. I need vitamins to try and get rid of this cold. And I would like to go to Persephone Books and maybe treat myself to a book. So I'll, I will uh, show you Persephone Books uh, and then I'm probably going to come home and try and rest so that I'm not sick for the rest of this week. They're obviously I probably am going to be. I just don't want to get too sick. I have some important meetings and I have more events for Franklin and Luna and the Book of Fairy Tales as well. There's other work that I have to do. I've got radio on Wednesday. I need to be able to speak. So um, yeah, I'm going to stop talking and I will catch up with you guys in a bit. <laughs> folks it is the next day and I thought I would wrap up my thoughts I am 80 pages from the end of the testaments so I'll speak about that now and then if anything drastically changes in those last 80 pages I will speak about it in my end of month wrap up once I have finished reading it um, I didn't and I'm not going to get to the Starless Sea by Erin Morganston in this video I'll talk about that at some other time I did think it was probably quite ambitious to try and read that book as well as the others considering they're all pretty lengthy. Um, before we get on to the testaments, well, let me briefly flip back to this one. This is The Imaginary Friend by Stephen Chbosky. I'm DNFing it. I am, um, I'm just, I'm not enjoying it. His writing style in this is very, very different to the perks of being a wallflower and I feel like he's trying to emulate a lot of horror writing and that falls into some cookie cutter type characters and it just feels a bit it feels like lots of stories I've read before unfortunately plus it feels like it needs so much editing I love a slow story adore a slow story would prefer that massively over a fast-paced story if it means you get to know the characters and the world feels really realized around you but in this book it just feels a bit mundane and I have looked up reviews from people who I trust just to see whether the concerns I have right now are concerns they had when they'd finished it and pretty much everybody is saying that, that it's just not really worth the effort of reading an 800 page book, the payoff just isn't worth it. And I have lots of books on my shelves that I really want to get to so I'm just going to leave it. I'm going to leave it, not for me, move on, that's fine. But the testaments, as I said, I'm 80 pages from the end and you may see the smile on my face. I am really enjoying it. I'm very, very much enjoying it. And I am surprised by that because, well, just, I suppose maybe with the secret Commonwealth and, and let's not even talk about the cursed child, but the expectations that you have to read a book, a sequel to a series or one standalone book that you have loved so much uh, and feel like you have invested part of your soul into. The Testaments is set at various times actually. I thought it was post Gilead but it actually dips into the history of Gilead as well which I am really enjoying. It's not a perfect book. It is very fast paced. 
And the way that I think about the Testaments is that it works when you pair it with The Handmaid's Tale. The Handmaid's Tale is a masterpiece and it stands on its own two feet. It is, as I've already said in this video and I've probably said before, it is a slow burn, it is meticulous and you really feel as though you're inside off red skin and you're experiencing everything along with her. You are uncovering aspects of Gilead as she learns about them and she's also not always the most reliable narrator either. She picks her timings when she's revealing secrets in her own past to you. So you trust her, but you also know that she's kind of not trusting you. Um, she is guarded and there are many reasons for her to be guarded. And I love the way that that story is told. And that, as I said, it stands on its own two feet. I think the Testaments really only works and is as good at it as it is because of its connection with The Handmaid's Tale. It strongly relies on the emotions that you have built up having read that first book. This in pacing is nearly the opposite of The Handmaid's Tale. So much happens in it and it is a real page turner and it's exciting in that respect. You're flitting between three different women and you're reading about their different experiences as ants, as children of commanders, and as people outside of Gilead. And I'm not gonna say who these characters are, um, though I think I knew who one of them was before going in because lots of people had already talked about that. Um, but I'm not gonna reveal who any of the characters are in this video here in case you wanna go into it not knowing anything. Um, you learn about the folklore that has been injected into the society of Gilead and you may have guessed that that would be something that I would really enjoy reading about. So there are, um, there's a fairy tale in here that's mentioned, let me find it because I did underline it. Oh yeah, it's the uh, concubine who was cut into 12 pieces and 12 is often a number that's used in folklore like the 12 dancing princesses. And it's about a woman who disobeys the man that she's betrothed to be married with and she's punished by being cut into 12 pieces. And one of the ants says, men must make sacrifices in war and women must make sacrifices in other ways. That is how things are divided. So that's how things are divided. That The man ends up not being divided at all and literally the woman is divided into 12 pieces. There are nursery rhymes in here as well. The children of commanders and their wives sing to each other. Um, and I really like the way that she builds on the world that she already established and unlike with The Secret Commonwealth, I felt as though these things were very organic. I believed that everything was tied to that original text. However, it does also feel like it is a sequel to the television series rather than a sequel to just the book. And as I said, I haven't read the TV series. I do know some spoilers for the TV series, which is why I know who some of the characters in this book are. But if I didn't know those spoilers, I wouldn't have the context for who those characters are. I'm assuming that their relationship with the characters in the previous book are gonna be revealed before the end of the Testaments. I don't know, I still have 80 pages to go. If their identity is not revealed, then I think I would find that a little bit unsatisfying. So I, I will talk about that in my wrap up once I have got to the end of it. But on the whole, yes, I think it is very good. I don't think that it is as beautiful or as lyrical as the first book. I think, as I said, it relies heavily on the first book in order for its emotional impact to be felt as much. I think without the first book, it would feel to me the same way I felt about The Power by Naomi Alderman, where it moved so quickly and so many horrific things were happening that it wasn't as though I didn't have an emotional connection to those things because they're terrible things. And I can appreciate that they're terrible things, but if you don't have that connection established with a character, then everything feels a bit disjointed and disconnected. And the only way that you can relate is by inserting your own feelings about 
your own life experiences. So I think I would feel very distanced from this book if I was reading it having not read The Handmaid's Tale. In fact, it's difficult to work out how much of it you would understand if you hadn't read The Handmaid's Tale. And that's absolutely fine because it is a sequel. I suppose the reason that I'm mentioning those things is mainly because, and I'm not gonna get into a huge discussion about this here, is because it jointly won the Booker Prize this year. And whenever I have judged literary prizes before, we have been explicitly told that a book needs to stand on its own two feet, and that's what you're judging it on. You're not judging it on whether it's, if it's a sequel, you're not judging it on the cumulative effect of the books that's come before it and that book. And you're of course not judging it on the career of the writer either. So is this book worth the hype? Yes. Is it worth the Booker Prize type hype? No, I, it's not Margaret Atwood's best book. It's a brilliant sequel to The Handmaid's Tale, but it very much feels like an add-on to that. In summary, these books are very much worth the hype, especially The Handmaid's Tale. If you haven't read it yet, please do read it. And The Testaments, very much enjoying. The Secret Commonwealth, is it worth the hype? No, and I still feel reluctant to say that because I'm hoping I'm going to wake up one morning and think, oh, actually, these are all the things that I missed and this redeems it, etc. Obviously, it's just my opinion. It's just my opinion. And it's my disappointment is measured against my love for the first books. So I think my disappointment feels greater because of the great love that I have for the first series. So no, but I'm hoping it may redeem itself in the third book, which will come out in a couple of years, I'm sure. Is The Imaginary Friend worth the hype? No, I'm afraid not. So those are my thoughts. Um, I would like to do more reading vlogs like this where they are themed and I pull specific books off my shelves and then, and then film and insert clips from life, etc. If you would like that, let me know in a comment down below. Let me know if you have read these books and what you have thought of them. Um, let me know how you felt about very hyped books in the past and whether you ended up loving them. Let's have a conversation. I hope you guys are having a great week and I will speak to you very soon. Lots of books, love. Bye.